Hello, podcast listeners. We know podcasts are a great way to catch up on a program that you may have missed on KSJE, and it's provided as a free service of this radio station. But you know, KSJE is now listener-supported, and so while you enjoy this podcast, we hope that you'll also take some time to join KSJE. Become a member today. It's quite easy to do. Just go to our website at ksje.com support and pick the level of support that best matches your budget. Thanks again for listening. Here's your podcast. This program is supported by San Juan Health Partners Urology, providing a wide range of personalized services for the whole family, including children. Our caring professionals are dedicated to helping meet your urology health needs with skill, experience, and service you need. For a complete listing of our services and to learn more, visit SanJuanHealthPartners.com or call 505-609-6300. San Juan Health Partners Urology, a division of San Juan Regional Medical Center. Well, let me turn to my guests who are here with me this morning. Always great to have uh, them here from the city of Farmington. Mayor Nate Duckett is here. Mayor, good morning. Good morning, Scott. How are you? I'm well. Thank you for coming in this morning. Always happy to do so. Appreciate you being here. Also, City Councilor Sean Scherer is here as well. Good morning to you. Good morning, sir. Thank you for being here. Not a problem. Appreciate you both coming in to talk a bit about, uh, well, budget for for the first thing I want to ask you both about, and then, of course, we'll move on to some other projects. But uh, there is a budget. The city has a budget uh, that's been agreed to, Mayor. There's a budget by law that we have to abide by in order to fund city services. Those pesky laws, darn it all. They are important. They are. Uh, But but July 1, you need a budget and you have one. We absolutely do. It passed last week, I believe, uh, City Council finalized it. So that has been put into motion for fiscal year 2020. All right. Now, there were some concerns because there was some talk about maybe having to um, close some facilities. There there was That was put out there and you heard from some constituents and I think both of you probably heard from a lot of folks about that, the idea to close the Children's Museum and the uh, Farmington Indian Center and those ideas are not as part of this new budget, correct? That is correct, yes sir. So what changed? What what was the concern, I guess, that, that was um, prompting the discussion to close them and then what changed? Sure, so I think you know, every year we have discussions about services that might be redundant. Like maybe we have a service here that's utilized in two facilities, and if there's a, a way that we can condense them, consolidate, and make it more efficient, then those are things we have to consider. And uh, some of the services that are provided at the Indian Center are also provided at our senior center. And the facility that's the E3 Museum, there are other places within the museum system where those programs could also be moved. So it wasn't a reduction of service as much as it was a looking at the facility costs, uh, maintenance costs, those things, and reducing that. Got but it. I mean, everything, every year, just understand that we have these discussions about closing facilities or, or, or reducing services. This year, though, it was actually posed as a question as, hey, in this budget, we're recommending these two facilities. And it, it was good. I think it was a good, a good thing for the council to have the discussion, to talk about what's important, and to get constituent feedback um, on those two particular facilities. Councilor Scher, what was your thoughts about, about, did you hear a lot from your constituents about this idea? Absolutely. I, I think I, I probably had dozens of calls from moms and dads um, really reaching out to me about the E3 Museum. Uh, it's a place that I, my daughter and I frequent. You know, I have a four-year-old daughter, and, and it's a nice, safe place for her to go and play. And, and uh, you know, I've always described it more as an interactive learning center than a museum. And uh, so my big concern with moving it to the the main museum, the Gateway Museum, was, you know, this isn't really a museum, the E3. It's more, like I said, an interactive learning center. And do are we going to take these two really good facilities, combine them to make one mediocre facility? And uh, that was really one of my big concerns. But also with the, with the Indian Center, I mean, this is a, a place that I don't frequent, um, but it is. It has a, a big following, and, and it's a, a safe place for the, the, the people who use it to go and, and, uh, and use the services that are available to them. So, you know, we have to look at it as elected officials that everything is the most important thing to somebody. Sure. And we have to weigh uh, financially what's, what's what, what, what we're going to fund and what we're going to cut. And with these two things, I think right now just wasn't the right time to be to be cutting them. I think we can, in the future, possibly consolidate some of these services slowly. I mean, I would love to see at the, at the main museum a, a multi-generational interactive uh, exhibits come. And we, I think we need to actively be looking for those types of things. But again, the E3 Museum isn't technically a museum, I don't think. I think that's a, it's, a, it's a different creature of its own. 
Right. And again, it's as you mentioned, it's marketed to children and families Absolutely. and it's more of an interactive And schools go there and sure. I mean it's it's always it's always busy when I'm there as well and I mean it's just, it's a nice little place to be. It was the library when I was a kid. So Right. And and that brings up my other point is that these but the both of these buildings are older and is that part of the issue too, is maintenance and, and things like that? Uh, it is. I mean, I, yeah, I'm over the years I mean, having been in a in an economy here for thirty years that just boomed uh, with oil and gas we are, were able to build a lot of facilities or to take over a lot of buildings or repurpose them uh, for services. And so we do have a large inventory of facilities. Then you have to look at those maintenance costs. And But the savings that we were going to receive for, from these two facilities, it really wasn't worth it to us to make that change. So we found some more creative ways to, to maneuver and make that budget work. Okay. So they're open. And so and we have a budget. And any other major changes? And I, and I know you always have to look at revenue and expenses. And has revenue been going okay this year? I've heard different well, things so, about gross receipts. And sure. I mean, it, gross receipts obviously has, has been impacted now since January with the increments that we, uh, gross receipts tax incre increments that went in force in January. So uh, we're starting to see that, that needle rise. But without those increments, no, the needle was not rising. Right. Uh, next year, we anticipated in this budget a 2% uh, change between this year and next year, not not a lot of, not a lot there, and all of that is really based on and built on those increments that we put in. So we're trying to stay afloat. We're we're four percent down uh, this year. We're from where we were in two thousand nine. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea of okay. how that works. And then, and that was the beginning of the Great uh, Recession, as it is that, called, right? Yes. So that was the last kind of peak year, I guess you would yeah. say, for 2000, revenue? 2009, we were at $55.9 in gross receipts tax revenue. Uh, we're anticipating in 2019 to be at 53.4. So a little bit of a, a drop off there. We've gotten back up. To but that's just to get back you back in. where you were 10 years ago. Yeah, and we're, yeah. we're, and and not we're, not, we're not there yet. Got so. It. And will we be there again? I don't know. It's tough to say, but I think that's what's important is for the taxpayers to understand government's going to reduce its size to fit what is there. We're going to maximize that dollar to ensure services are, are kept at a high level. And, and to say what the city of Farmington has been able to do since 2009 is I don't think you've seen a reduction of services or a lack of pride uh, in our facilities and our streets and, and what we offer, the programming that we offer. So, uh, But we're always challenging ourselves and we always challenge staff I mean, the, the library is going through a, a master plan right now for future, you know, for what their future looks like at the same time that the city is putting ourselves to the comprehensive plan. So we're updating that, which has not been done since 2005. Um, and, and that, you know, that's a $275,000 investment just to update a comprehensive plan. And that's been on the table to be considered each year, but has been pushed off, pushed off, pushed off. So this year we found a way to get that done. And, and really it was through the CTED the community transformation economic diversification increment uh, that we were able to, to accomplish that. There are some other highlights, but I'll, I'll let Sean, is there anything particular about the budget? Well, I know with, I mean, just like anyone else in, in San Juan County who's operating a business, we've, at the city here, we've we've had to learn to do more with less. I mean, we get better at our jobs, we get more creative with, with what we have, and, you know, we have great staff at the, at the city, and, I mean, it's just, we ask more and more of them every day, and they always produce for us. And they're producing for the citizens of Farmington. I mean, that's it's it's definitely a public service job for them. Sure, I mean, you so. can see just even now, um, as of yesterday, we did a pilot plan with community development and public works, where we had combined the two departments. I mean, historically they had been together, and then at some point they've been split off into two separate branches. Uh, we're going to move forward with that plan. So now we've got one director over what was to a two director job, and I think we're going to find better efficiencies within that. And and um, see them work together, uh, frankly, right. better for the citizens. And you've had a change, too, with the the um, resignation of Corey Styron, who was your um, outdoor recreation or a director, basically, sure. right? Yep. And uh, and that's moving into more of the economic development uh, branch, which right. is Warren Unsicker, right? And right. so that's so, kind uh, of well, combined, too? So with Warren and Corey's hiring into that position, um, Warren was still, I mean, he's handling a lot of the, obviously, the economic diversification component that includes ORI manufacturing and industry. So making that shift there with Warren was very natural. Uh, frankly, it adds some additional things for, for Warren to have on his plate that he can be working on. And then within our Parks and Rec division, we have a, a planner. She's been with us now for, 
I think probably eight months. Um, she's fantastic. We probably have the best park superintendent. He worked here at the college, uh, Doug Abbey. Doug is fantastic. So I think we really do have a good core team when it comes to these different conversations we're having regarding outdoor recreation that can we can put this together. So. Sure. But is that something that you all, uh, Council Chair, you too, you look at when there is a, maybe a resignation or someone leaving the city? Is there a place where maybe you can consolidate or, or kind of shift things around? And so maybe it doesn't mean that everyone is uh, replaceable once they do decide to uh, retire or, or leave. And there might be a better way to move things around or someone already on staff who can take on some of these additional responsibilities and save a little bit of money. Uh, salaries and benefits, I know, are a big uh, big part of your budget. It's the number one part of the budget, Scott, yeah. as it is with most organizations. That's true. Here at the yeah. college, same thing. That's yeah. true. So is that something you look for? I think absolutely. When we're when we're when when someone resigns or a, a, a position becomes available, we always we always see if that's something that a, another team or person can envelop if they can take over those responsibilities and save the taxpayers a little bit of money. Um, again, just like we would in, in our own private businesses, um, if we have some, if we have a high paid uh, person retire at the end of a long career, do we do we need to replace that person or is this a respon- are these responsibilities that someone else can take over? Right. So. And still and still maintaining that level of service Absolutely. and expectation Absolutely. Uh, from within that department. But I mean, kudos to city manager uh, Mays. He does a tr- every single time these things come up. He's looking for opportunities uh, to intertwine and and kind of sew in some new ideas of whether or not that can be done. Can we? shift some jobs around is there a more efficient way that it's being done best practices uh, as a person in his in his position i would say he stays the most trained and updated um, on what's going on nationwide in cities all across the united states so he's always looking for those opportunities sure and one last question about the budget because i know a lot of folks who are listening to us this morning maybe watching us this morning would say but you know i i can't raise taxes when when i'm running short on funds or when my budget is larger than my my means and so What's your answer to to that person? Well, I mean, if, yeah, I mean, if there's if there's services that people don't want, then by all means, come and ask us and tell us which services you don't want. But as Councilor Sher said, I mean, some it's every facility or every program is that is somebody's favorite thing, and so we have to weigh what the collective community wants or what they don't want, um, and that that to me, I mean, there's got to be a, a certain sense of pride in, in who we are as a city, and those services are representative of that, and the people who live there are representative of that. So. But really, it's on the community. I, I tell you what, I've never had anybody come to me and say we should stop doing something. Mm-hmm. Um, they want us. They want us to, you know, stop spending as much. But but don't don't, but don't stop paving don't roads. Stop, I mean, don't yeah, stop that, policing the streets. That, and those are our biggest. Those are our biggest things sure. on the budget. So yeah, roads and I mean, police. So if we're gonna if we're gonna cut something of any substance, it has to be from public safety or public works. And I mean, no no one wants bad roads or sa- unsafe streets. Right. Well, you just take a, a simple example of Lions Pool. I mean, Lions Pool is aging. Um, somewhere a rumor came up that we were going to close Lions Pool. That's that wasn't a part of the conversation, but it went within that facility. It's a facility that costs taxpayers, you know, four hundred thousand dollars a year, mm-hmm. and it brings in twenty thousand dollars of revenue. So you're subsidizing that for almost the full cost of operation of that facility. But that's a quality of life thing for somebody who has arthritis, uh, a senior citizen who who needs to exercise. That's the perfect pool for them to do that in. You can't close that down and take that away. Brookside was a great example. Brookside pool closed. The, the people in the city said, where's our pool? What are you doing about it? Why wasn't there a plan to replace it? Why did you wait till the last minute? And so you have to react to those situations. But the community transformation and economic diversification uh, fund that we've talked about on this show many times, I mean, that component's built in there because we have a very short window of opportunity right now to take advantage of the outdoor recreation and, and th- that exists out there in the United States. There's a big big movement sure. uh, mm-hmm. focused on this. And okay. so if somebody calls us the next Moab, to some degree, we should believe that hype. And what could we do to meet that expectation? Those are things that, that the community came together and said, yes, help us diversify. I, when I ran for mayor, the, I was, one of the most important questions I was asked repeatedly was, what are you going to do that's different? Where, are you really going to diversify the economy? Man, I tell you what, having been in the public office now for five years, I don't think there's anything more difficult in the world than trying to change the face of your community. And, but we have put in motion the proper components to do that. And it's catching fire. And we're, I'm, I'm excited about that opportunity. I think we are seeing some traction in, in some of these things that, that we're talking about. And when you say um, the next Moab, some people might say, but Moab has all these natural things as Farmington does with Absolutely. our mountain bike trails and, and things that aren't too far away or outside of, outside of town. But Moab also has built some other 
quality of life, I think, amenities, and that's kind of what you're talking about, of how the city can be a player in providing some of these things so when folks come to visit and take advantage of these natural resources, they can also go take a dip in the pool, go right. do something else, go to the lake, go do whatever. Well, right? it's a public-private partnership in that regard because you're trying to build things that attract people here so the businesses get business. I mean, that's really what you want to do. The businesses can then play their employees, and the employees can take care of their families, and you know, it, it trickles down down the line. So yes, yeah, so when you can when you can provide a package and give you an example of of uh, you know, I want to have a baseball tournament here, and I want to sell this baseball tournament to try and attract sixty teams to the area. Well, if a baseball team knows that they can come here and they can go to Bisti Bay and they go swim at the lake, or they can go to the river trails at Berg Park, or they can go to the museum. Those things are very, very attractive, not just for the people who live here, but the people who want, who might visit here. You have a fan on Facebook, Mayor Duckett, thanking you for uh, recognizing that Lions Pool is a quality of life uh, uh, amenity for the city. Absolutely. So uh, thanks for your comment, Facebook viewer. And uh, let me ask you a bit. You mentioned um, diversifying the economy, but there's one part of the economy that, uh, that you're really trying to support and, and keep alive, and that is power plant. Oh, yeah, well, I, and jobs. Right, I love And it. you can't talk about power plan without talking about jobs. I think that's Absolutely. an important part of the conversation. It truly is. Um, and that's a part of the conversation when we were in Santa Fe this year uh, that you really want to, you, you, we have to tell that story. And you have to put faces to that story. And so to sit in commission meetings with 40 or 50 uh, coal miners and understanding that each of those coal miners married, kids, brothers, sisters, whatever, I mean, they're taking care of their families. Um, that's a really important component because they live here, the kids go to school here, the fact that their kids go to school here means there's money for Farmington Municipal Schools because they're doing business in this community. That means that the businesses in our town thrive better. So yeah, 1,100 jobs is a big deal. Um, the people's faces that go along with it are a bigger deal. And so what's the latest on that? Because the city has taken the stand that, that it is looking at other um, options to try to keep that plant open, to try to use some newer technology to make it a cleaner plant, to um, meet some of these state requirements and, right, well, and things well, along that line. What's the, what's the latest? Yeah, you know, the carbon sequestration component will make this plant the cleanest coal plant in the world. Uh, that that is, that to me is the kind of the selling point. If I'm an environmentalist, uh, if I want to keep jobs, those two things can go together here. Um, and there has been a lot of positive feedback that we've received uh, from the White House, from the Department of Energy because they recognize that, guess what, there's a thousand coal plants in, in the globe right now. There's a thousand more waiting to be built and developing countries aren't going to just pass up what, what the coal power can bring to them. That's what, what's made America great. Energy makes America great. And coal has been a, an important component of that. So if we can have a power plant whose real purpose to some degree is to provide CO2 or take the CO2 out of the stacks, put it into a pipeline that can be used by drilling companies. That's really what this company wants to do. Right. They want to take the by the power is the byproduct of what they're trying to sell. So that's it. That's kind of an interesting and exciting component because now it's not just about San Juan Generating Station, a very tiny you know coal plant in Northwest New Mexico. Now it's about the coal plants in China, in India, and other places in the world where you can say. Hey, check this out. This is what we can do. And if we care about the globe and we care about the environment and we care about the future, look how we can utilize this important, important energy source uh, and also have a, a, a clean planet. But the critics, Mayor, with all due respect, would say it's expensive. It's unproven. There's only two plants that are using that technology in North America. Sure. But you have an investor, you have a company that seems to think that it's, it's worth their time and money and effort to look into this here. Well, the Department of Energy has a grant that they've put out for this specific project. There was three grants that they put out, and this is a specific project. So clearly, they're not the only crazy people, right? I mean, this has been put out there to say, look, we, we're willing to fund this because it's a greater there's a greater picture here. But to say that it, there's only two, well, there's going to be a third. Mm -hmm. Where is that third going to be? And why can't it be right here in San Juan County? And think about the benefit that would bring to us. Clearly, and I'll, I mean, I'll let Sean talk on this as well, but... There's no municipality that has ever taken this type of, of stand and has ever taken this direction before. And it, so it's a very unique component, but we were very uniquely placed as part owner of this power plant. And now, past 2022, we are 100% owner of the power plant. So we've got to right. play the cards that have been dealt to us. But the company that is, that is uh, coming forward, Enchant Energy, they were here this week. Uh, they've brought a feasibility study that will be presented. A very positive, 
very positive study. Uh, I got to sit in, into a couple meetings on that. Council will get to consider it and, and see what the future holds. But uh, again, clean power, jobs. I mean, the state standard or what, what, what is produced right now is 2,100 pounds uh, per megawatt hour of carbon coming out of that plant, which by right. the way, that's all that really comes out of the plant is carbon. Um, what it will end up being is 200 and 210 pounds per megawatt hour, which will meet California's requirement, our state's requirement, opens up all new markets again for that power plant to provide energy. It will run cleaner than the backup power that's required to have when you have solar and wind because they only work a third of the day. So you have to have backup power for that. And right now that's natural gas. This cleaner will, than natural gas. This will run cleaner than a natural gas plant. Um, those are really really cool things. And why not? Why not? I'd rather have a source of power that can run 100 times 100% of the day than have a, a source of power that only runs a third that I have to build additional power to back that up with. It just it seems simpler to me. Sean Scherer, Councilor Scherer, what's your thoughts on, on this? Because I think a lot of folks are excited and they certainly are concerned about these jobs as, as the mayor rightfully um, talks about, but they're also concerned about the city's resources and, and maybe not looking before you're leaping and then that kind of a thing. And I know the council <laughs> is trying to do due diligence. We're not losing mayor. any... Re sure, well, I know... If I'm wrong, please correct me. By all, means, means. Sure. <laughs> By all means. By all means. You know, at the end of the day, if, if we don't do anything and we lose these jobs, I mean, how, uh, how could we as elected officials live with ourselves? I mean, it's 1,100 jobs. Any other community would do almost anything they could to bring 1,100 to bring new 1100 jobs. jobs we're trying to save 1,100 jobs. The, farm the fact that the state got involved in this at all, that kind of makes me upset. And this is our power plant. We own the power plant. Let us do what we want with our power plant. You know, they, the legality of the, of the law they passed, I, I won't argue that. I'm not a lawyer. But they definitely picked on us. They, they found this piece of property, and they, and they, they tailored this, this bill to only attack our piece of property. But... You know, this we, is the Energy Transition Act you're yeah, talking about. Yeah, but that was we fight against the state all the time. Sure. So, I mean, that's just another thing that we have to deal with. So, I mean, we, we're, we're used to that. Right. Um, but, you know, having these 1,100 jobs here, it's, it's important to us. And, you know, I've been reading these articles about carbon capture and sequestration because it's interesting to me. I think it's, again, it's, it's yes, it's expensive and they say it's unproven, uh, but everything's unproven at some point and everything's expensive when it first starts. But you know, I just read an article in Norway where they're actually doing this carbon capture and putting the CO2 back into the ground where it's creating new minerals for them to actually mine. And uh, oh. it's, it's interesting that other places in the world are starting to see this and uh, get this done. Um, and, you know, it'd be great if we, could, if we could teach the rest of the world right here in San Juan County how to make coal clean. Because, right. again, well, if, I, if you're really caring about the environment, it's not the San Juan Generating Station that's doing something to the environment, per se. It's China that's doing things bad to the environment. Let's show China how to do this. And if we can do that on a, on a bigger scale, like a, a power plant of our size, this could be a, a leader in, in the you know in the, in, the, in, the, in the industry sure sounds very exciting and mayor i mean am i uh, am i wrong that the city is is at a well, certain amount me. of risk I mean, what do you well no because that's the whole point of what of what these negotiations are okay with this company is to minimize risk that's that's the number one thing and i think it's important for, for the uh, audience uh, to hear it, that, that, yeah, that, that the number one thing for us to consider is ensuring our liabilities do not grow past 2022 i mean that that's that's it mm -hmm. so how can we make this deal work with this company so that our liabilities don't grow, that our power costs don't go up, uh, that we kind of secure ourselves in that. And that is a big component of what we've been negotiating to this point and what council will be considering. So, no, I mean, the only cost that we're talking about right now is manpower. But to the same degree of how much money it would cost us to do a pilot solar project, as you, as you mentioned off air earlier. Um, I'm still recovering from your answer to that yeah, question. Okay, actually, we can, we can invest. We can invest some here to, to something that would have that would bear some amazing fruit. I mean, something truly amazing uh, that could come from the maintaining of those jobs and having a clean coal power plant. And the possibility of creation of new jobs. I mean, the the, the well, the, the carbon sequestration the, component. That's a plant that's, all in its own. That's right. True. So there'd that's be true. other. So there'd be supporting services. There would more be jobs just for that. I right. Mean, Absolutely. But I keep hearing about how the cost of solar is now competitive with the cost of some of these other energy producing technologies. And Mayor, you mentioned that solar only runs certain hours of the day. It certainly isn't a 24 seven um, power generating facility. We all right. understand that when the sun's not out, there's no there's no energy. But you still want your power on. I would. Right. Yeah, please. <laughs> right. But what, you know, is there any way that the city could be a leader in some of some of these other types of technology to show that we're not just tied to 
coal and well, natural city, gas. But the city and the county are both open to any private company who wants to come in and, and build solar. There's no issue there at all. We've always right. taken that stance. But the city is its but own I'm not going to take. So well, it couldn't is. it? But but if I have a utility uh, that is providing affordable and reliable power, which is the two components, and in the last was it last year, year before, when we had a solar study done, and those costs were brought to us, they made no sense. So and you've looked the, at this already. We look at it all the time. Yeah. At the end of the I mean, day, it's things, a financial not, decision. It's yeah. a financial decision. It's yeah. always, and, and that's right. how I, my belief in, in government to some degree. Reliable, affordable. It needs, well, it needs to be based on the dollars. It really needs. I mean, if we made policies just based on our emotions all the time, we'd be broke just like the United States. Right. And that's what's going on up there. So, But we can't afford to do that. Yeah, we, we can't print money, so we can't, we can't pass ordinances that give us warm, and fuzzy I feelings. And I if think... I had a ducat buck to spend, I would spend it. Yeah. <laughs> a ducat buck? Yes. And I, and I think <laughs> to the component of what what this community wants. That's the other thing we talked about earlier in regards to services and what you cut and, and what you keep. I mean, if there was if there was a thousand people who showed up and said, look, we're really interested in solar and we want to do something with solar, then I think the council looks at it and goes, okay, well, now we need to do another study. But those things came at the end of Tommy Roberts' uh, term as mayor. They brought those numbers to us. The council looked at it and said, we're not going to pay for that additional amount because we're going to have to subsidize the solar or every rate payer is going to have to pay for, for that little bit of solar. Solar on a broader scale is much more affordable. So if you if you built a 10 megawatt solar field, right. um, then yes, it, obviously the prices drop for each person who's using that solar power. But you can purchase right now on within our electric rates, you can purchase solar power. It's a part of what's, what you can do if you want to buy solar power. But understand that where that solar power is coming from is coming onto a line with other electrons from other sources of power. And so do you know that you're exactly getting just solar power? I mean, that that's a component right now. But uh, sure. affordable reliability is a key. And I think what we're going to get out of this, uh, out of the, the opportunity with this power plant, I mean, it's going to be cleaner than the, the backup power that would be there for solar. So I... Okay. But I'm just, we're seeing more and more... Um, entities developing solar fields. Uh, you know, the hospital has a solar field. Um, I think Aztec Schools has something. The Navajo Tribe is building some things. You know what's funny is when I was a kid, my father moved us to California because he wanted to get into the solar industry. And that's, I was born there, and then so that was 1977. But it was expensive and unproven back then. It was, <laughs> it was expensive and unproven back then. And right. now it's now and now we're finding, and through technology, obviously it's getting better. But the backup power component of a Scott is really the key. I see. It's the battery component and, and having the battery storage to provide a utility scale solar facility. Those are very different. But you're in a town of 43,000 people. We're, we're, we're still below where we were in 2009, putting our money and smart places is, is key. Do we put money into something that people aren't asking for? And we have I mean, to think that, about the sustainability and long-term health of the electric utility because it's not here to make money. It's here as a public service. I mean, sure. that's why it's a public service company. Right. Um, so we have to think about the, the long-term health of that. True. And that's one of the other unique aspects of the city of Farmington, though, mm -hmm. is that it has its own electric utility Absolutely. and is able Very to do cool. some of these things and, Very cool. and has yeah. been able to insulate, I think, the rate payers from some of the ups and downs of the energy uh, business yeah, over the, the lowest years. cost electric rates that you'll find, it, I mean, anywhere in this region. I right. mean, it, it's, it, they've done a really good job managing that. And the funds that are built in there now, because there are funds in this account, but they're there to ensure that if we do lose a large portion of our power from sandwich generating station or some other other issues, we have the ability to to build new if we need to. A comment on Facebook, Mayor Duckett, is sure. um, it can't be all about money. It also needs to be based on what we leave behind for generations to come. Don't I, you agree with that? Absolutely. That's, what, I, that's I'm, part of what we're I fighting for. I was a Boy Scout, so station. I mean, I, I believe that we need to leave things better than we found them. Right. And right. I think with the carbon sequestration, um, that's a big that's a big component of this. Because, again, we need to have power. I mean, we, we live in a great a great place today because when you flip the switch the light comes on uh refrigeration the hospital has power i mean there's those are things that we need to think about and those are the things we need to think about for our next generation too is that how do we how do we keep sustainable electricity affordable for everyone and i mean with and again i think i think in at, at some point in our lives in my life solar will be uh you know a, a, a real viable We've thing that, for yeah. our our electric utility to look at currently it could be a it could be a component. I'm not saying it's not. I'm not against solar at all. Um, but I think what we have right now, fighting for the, the carbon sequestration um, at the 
power plant, not just before the jobs, but for the power, I think is, is by far our, our necessity. There's right a now. balance that needs to be struck to some degree. And, and in the conversations we had in Santa Fe, it was always interesting how you know, the, the, the job component gets pushed into this idea that you can just retrain a workforce and they're going to they're gonna be okay. And in those conversations with senators, on, on one senator in particular, I mean, that's the first thing he said to me, well, just retrain them. Well, Senator, what would you like us to retrain them to do? And I asked that question to uh, Dr. Pendergrass here at the college. I said, when you're seeing minors that are, have been, you know, let coal go, minors, coal right. minors, who've been let go and, they, and they're coming to San Juan College, what jobs are they, what are they looking for? And the struggle, of course, is that they've been making a good living uh, as a coal miner. And now with their skill set, it's, it's a, it's a blue collar skill set. Are there a lot of blue collar jobs in New Mexico that fits the skill set that they have? And frankly, there's not. I mean, it's, you're in energy, and that's your skill set. And right now we've lost, I don't know, we've lost 5% of the population or something to that degree um, because the energy sector's up, up and downs. So, so they're trying to find jobs that, that will start being able to feed their family quickly, um, truck drivers, things of that nature, or what do they do? They have to move. Mm -hmm. they got to move somewhere else where their skill set will fit. And I think that's what we've seen a lot of, of the population decline is because these guys – and, we, and ladies are hard workers. They're trying to find somewhere they can take care of their family. Absolutely. And I and I mentioned that, by the way, to the senator. I said, well, senator, they're going to end up leaving the state of New Mexico. You understand that? And he goes, well, if they have to move, they have to move. And that 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 attitude right there really, it struck me. And I said, well, sir, you're an elected official as I am, and we're trying to promote jobs and trying to promote the economy, and losing 1,100 people out of the state. Well, I, I came up in communities where we lost large manufacturing plants, and these 1,100 jobs aren't that big of a deal. And so you're you're struck by this because he's in Albuquerque, and I'm up here in the northwest corner of the state, and maybe it doesn't impact him that way, but it's going to. I mean, it's going to. San Juan General Station has been a stalwart providing base load power for decades, low cost base load power. What's going to happen when this if if this were to, were to transition out of P and M's? Well, it's going to in 2022. Um, they're going to have to replace it, and it will be more expensive power that they replace it with. That's that's just a fact. So every P&M customer will have that on their bill. And maybe that's okay with them, which that's totally up to them. Right. Not okay with you. I prefer not to. Sure. I mean, I, I think the low-cost living is a, a crucial component uh, of a community, providing, especially when it comes to power and utilities. I mean, those two things, because I like to turn my, I like to charge my iPhone. Um, I like to make sure that, that that's working. My kids uh, with their computers for school, I mean, those are important components. I want to make sure it's affordable to do the things that we need to do as a people. I want to water my lawn when we're allowed to water the lawn. This year you can water your Thank lawn, Thank you Scott. for that. I appreciate <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, so there's water in the river. Um, Lots of water. And and have it something that's that's affordable. And, and even when it's affordable, it seems not affordable sometimes because, <laughs> right. you know, that that's just – Somebody's got to take care of the water lines. Understood. Councilor Scher, we're running uh, just a couple more minutes this morning, but any other final thoughts on uh, this topic or something else? Well, I know when when, when I was in Santa Fe for these committee meetings and they were telling people that we should just retrain these workers, it was it was frustrating to me because I think I think about an attorney. I mean, a guy who's been an attorney for 30 years, and all of a sudden the state says you're not allowed to be an attorney anymore. Not because you did anything wrong, because just because we hate attorneys. So you're not allowed to be an attorney anymore but we'll retrain you. Well, that attorney has dedicated his whole life to the law. That's all he knows. That's all he wants to know. And for 30 years, that's what he's been doing. He doesn't want to be retrained. So what's he going to do? He's going to go to a state that doesn't hate lawyers. And that's the same thing we're going to do with these, with these coal miners. Their only crime is that the, you know, the state legislature hates coal. That's it. And so what are they going to do? They're not going to be retrained. They're going to go somewhere where they can, where they can mine coal because that's what they want to do. Well, and the yeah. carbon sequestration provides that balance. Absolutely. It provides that balance. Absolutely. And I think that's exciting. We're seeing more and more of these of, of jobs being replaced by artificial intelligence and different things, right? I mean, you're, we're seeing that happen all the time. I can look at the industry that I came up in, and that was, that was in enter entertainment retail. I mean, the, the things that Hastings sold, they're gone. You can get them all on your phone now. Um, True. So True. the workers that were required to, well, to make the CD – to package the CD, to ship the CD, the guy who delivered the CD to the to Hastings, who had to unpackage it, <laughs> right. price tag it, put it on a shelf, and then you have to alphabetize it. I mean, just think of all the people who touched that one piece of product, and then you have to sell it. And then you got to bag it, and then it leaves. And that's you, all changed. That's all gone. Those mm -hmm. jobs are gone. My daughter's fixing to hit the workforce. What is my daughter going to do? Well, certainly in food service, food service still exists. 
uh, for now, right? I mean, so far, so that's right. There's opportunities that exist there. We do have in this community a very strong retail uh, chain presence, which is great. So those those jobs will be there. But you can see what what big companies like McDonald's. McDonald's has decided not to fight the minimum uh, wage uh, rates anymore because they don't have to. They can replace that kid at the counter with a computer screen. Right. So right. they don't they don't need to worry about it. But hometown hamburgers or some of these local other places, that's a real issue for them. How do we keep those places open? How do we keep people employed uh, when there's so much of a fight against it? Internet sales is another example. And a cheeseburger is just going to be more expensive now because you have to pay for the worker. And that's what people understand when we talk about raising a minimum wage. You are also raising the cost of living. So it doesn't really matter to me if I make $15 an hour or $3 an hour. How many loaves of bread can I buy? True. That's what I really care about. Right. right. That's right. But the cost of that hamburger is going to go up maybe by a few cents if the minimum wage would go up by a few dollars. Isn't that how it works? When you spread when you spread it out anyway, but that's Possibly a whole other show. Possibly the economies of scale, it could oh, be. Yeah. I mean, that's a whole other show, gentlemen. Of scale, for sure. We are we are out of time, and uh, we could yeah. talk about this all all day, but we have to do something else. Absolutely. So I apologize. But Councilor Sheriff, thanks for coming in this morning. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, sir. Mayor Duckett, thank you for being here. Always a pleasure. If you print any Duckett bucks, please let me know. I would I, need I to would make like some to, bucks to spend you. them. Please Bring do. You a stack. Yes, I would I would spend them. <laughs> If I could. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. My guest from the city of Farmington here on KSJE. I'll be back with more in just a moment, everyone. The time is 848. This program is supported by San Juan Regional Medical Center, who's expanding its services to offer low-cost blood screenings all year round. Now offering walk-in convenience to get the blood tests you want when you want them. My Labs Patient Ordered Testing is available in Farmington at the hospital's laboratory and the outpatient diagnostic center on 30th Street. Also in Aztec at San Juan Health Partners Family Medicine at 120 Yano Street. With nearly 20 tests available, there's an option for everyone. My Labs Patient Ordered Testing, a wellness service of San Juan Regional Medical Center. The material discussed in this program is for information purposes only. It is not intended to be used as a recommendation for investing or as legal advice. Each person has his or her specific situation, circumstance, and objective and should consult their own personal advisor or counsel. Thursday morning here on KSJE, and it's time to check in with Jason Kelko from Citizens Trust and Investment Corporation to see what the economy's been doing this week. Uh, Jason, good morning. Good morning. How are you this morning? I'm good. I'm good. We've had another uh, up and down week. Yes, we have. Um, and we've, we've got a new country in the trade mix, too. We've got Mexico now. Right. We didn't want the them to feel left out, I guess. So <laughs> no, no, we, no. Uh, the president has uh, turned his attention to them, I guess. Yeah, uh, he has. He has. So we, we've had a really bumpy week. Uh, Monday... We saw the biggest drop of the week. Um, we saw the NASDAQ fall about 1.6%, and it, that actually enters uh, correction territory right there. So they're mm. about 10% off the high that they were at in uh, April. Okay. So something to definitely watch. Uh, S&P and the Dow were pretty flat, down a little bit on Monday. Um, but the NASDAQ was hit particularly hard um, due to some reports that came out from the U.S. government um, saying that they are going to take a look at some of the bigger tech companies and um, basically look at antitrust stuff and business practice probes. Right. Uh, just to kind of make sure they're doing everything. Interesting. Right. right. Yeah. Um, and so those are like the Facebooks of the world, the right. Googles, the Amazons. Those are the big three at least. Yep. Right? Those are the ones that were all named. Apple was included in oh, that mix as well. Yeah, sure. Yep. Right. Um, and then uh, so understandably, the, the shares for those companies took a little bit of a hit. I would think uh, so. When that news came out. Okay. So and then Monday, we also had a little bit of talk from the Fed about um, just kind of easing people's tension about uh the, the global slowdown right now. Uh, the Fed did mention something about interest rates. Carry on into Tuesday. So we had this Monday where everything was down a little bit. Uh, Tuesday, everything was a surge. There was a huge oh. stock rally. Okay. Uh, the Dow was up more than 500 points, about 2%. NASDAQ was up 2.7%. And the S&P was up 2%. So quite the roller coaster okay. ride from Monday to Tuesday. Short memories, or yeah, I or guess. What? Well, we had Mexico and the Mix again. Uh, Mexico was in the headlines. Uh, stocks rose on speculation that there were some Republican lawmakers that came out that said that on a national emergency basis they would try to block these tariffs that the president has been talking about putting on Mexico against Mexico. I right. see. Okay. Um, so so a little bit of consumer confidence back after that. Mexico and China both came out on Tuesday with comments alluding to a commitment to find some common ground in trade and then in immigration as well for Mexico. Okay. Um, really trying to, I think that's one of the bigger uh, points with uh, the president kind of right. trying to strong our Mexico at this point. Sure. So, well, at least, uh, I guess, in a lot of the president's fans may say, at least it got 
Mexico's attention sure. maybe by by saying this uh, this reactionary thing. Sure, and you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of people out there that you know, we were on an uneven playing field for a long time with the World Trade Organization with some of these countries and I mean, this is a bit of a strong arm tactic, but if it works and we can kind of level the playing field with trade, it will be good for us in the long run. Um, right. It's just going to be a struggle to get there. And I think that's what folks are concerned about. They are. They are. And the Fed came out again on Tuesday. You know, the Fed chair, Jerome Powell, uh, they, he reiterated that the Fed would act appropriately to sustain the current expansion. So um, a lot of people are pricing interest rate cuts in the mix this year. Uh, that's up to about a 90% chance now in wow. September. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then another 80% chance for another cut in December. So I think we're, we're really looking at that as a possibility right now to, to have that happen. Interesting. And they're not that high to begin with. They're not that high to begin with. No, so, there's not a lot of wiggle room there. Okay. Um, and then, you know, the Fed, they're, they're keeping their balance sheet a little bigger too than they had post-crisis uh, 2008 mm -hmm. to kind of give another option for them to use instead of just interest rates. Okay. Um, so that's their... Um, and then one of the bigger things that happened Wednesday, we were up a little bit, uh, investor confidence rose, and, uh, but the major story is kind of the bear market for oil right now. Yeah, what's going on there? Well, we, it's fallen a little bit. It fell about 3.4% yesterday. Uh, we're at 51.68 a barrel. Uh, so kind of the lower end of what we'd like to see in this area. Sure. Um, right. But yeah, the U.S. reserves are way up. They're at about 6% above the five-year average. Uh, the major concern is weakening demand due to global growth concerns and, uh, again, the trade war that we've got going on with the two biggest world economies. Interesting. Okay. Um, but here we are at summertime. That's a big travel season. That's right. So you would think demand would be going up. Hopefully go up again. And we got OPEC and Russia and, you know, OPEC, OPEC and friends, we like right. to call them. Right. Uh, they, they're supposed to meet late June, early July to discuss their policies. And um, they've cut production, you know, for a long time now. So I would look to them to kind of look to ramp production back up a little bit so hopefully that demand spikes and uh, and we can see oil raise a little bit this summer okay well we'll see how it goes yeah. so perfect natural gas still doing what it we're does we're still treading water yeah we right. did below 240 we're at 237 Ouch. i know i know um there are i did read some articles there are some venture capitalists that are looking at better ways to start shipping liquid natural gas uh down exporting to, it yeah down right. the caribbean okay and uh down in that area so hopefully something will come from that and we can start exporting a lot of natural gas and okay that would help this area because it, right it certainly would and and we never really talk about you know we have so much of an abundance of natural gas mm -hmm. in this country even north america and there are a lot of countries that don't and they have to import most of their natural gas or propane or whatever they're using i suppose right yep, so. exactly so if we could find a way to fill that demand that would that would help out a lot it would all right jason thanks for coming hey, in thanks for having me appreciate it very much that's jason calcutt everybody from citizens trust and investment corporation my guest here on ksje farmington did you enjoy that podcast? We hope that you did. And if you did, share it with your friends. And if you really want to keep podcasts like this coming, please support KSJE. You can do it easily online at ksje.com.